Have you heard of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Oh, that's great, man. I was ready for you. You were ready? You looked like you were ready to run. That's what you were, yeah, you were ready. I was ready to fucking fight. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, that looked like more of a, a skedaddle stance. Yeah, but yeah, I I ready, I ready, no I cursing, ready. Anthony. Well, I, I said there was no cursing. Yeah, I, I didn't think there was... You know? I think you went yeah. to go you a fan? I'm not, not going to go on YouTube. That's a great nah. evangelization yeah. method, by the way. Pope yeah. Francis would not approve. <laughs> <laughs> threatened oh. them like he was pulling a gun. <laughs> Pull the gun, yeah, yeah. That's always a classic move. That's a classic Nic move. Nicholas Cavazos is back from the monastery, man. Yo, how long were you there? 30 days? Just a little over, yeah. A little over 30 days. So and I we don't have a tonsure, so that's good. That's good news, everyone. I don't we were supposed to have uh, Jesse Romero on tonight, and Jesse texted me uh, like this afternoon, and he's like, hey, can, can we reschedule? So we're going to get Here's the deal. We're going to do Nick. So Nick was supposed to be on Tuesday and Jesse was supposed to be on tonight. And we're going to do trivia Thursday. Jesse's going to do Thursday next week. And we're going to do trivia on Tuesday. So you guys are getting trivia. Nick is going to join us for trivia. So everybody, please like subscribe. We are going to do one hour here tonight. And then we're going to do one hour on locals tonight because we are going to get into some spicy stuff on Locals tonight. <laughs> Nick has a few things he wants to talk about. We also have a few videos that I think if we played on here, we'll get copyright strike. So I don't want to play them on here. <clears throat> so we're going to do Locals at the end of this stream. Uh, Rob, is there any new podcast reviews? Um, I have not checked. Let me pull that up real quick. Yeah, let's check out this. Nick, have you heard this bit that we do? Bro, I saw a clip of it the other day. I died. It was... <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. I thought Dude, about our, myself. <laughs> our viewers are so funny, man. Like, so every episode, we just check and see if anybody left new podcast reviews and we pull them up and we read them. Dude, they're funny, man. Some of them are really funny. We have we have a Protestant convert that watches, and he, the funniest line he's like, it's like these Catholics have a Protestant thinking of converting to Judaism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Dumpster, Dumpster fire, fire of the rock. topics others won't touch. An exercise in patience, rolling dumpster fire of self-deprecation that clearly focuses on the margins and marginally improving each week. We do we actually <laughs> marginally improve each week? I That's guess pretty... so. That was a good one, actually. It's yeah. a dumpster fire, but five stars. I'll take it. <laughs> is this NPR? Every time I listen to the opening, I feel like Rob is going to explain how awful climate change is, <laughs> and then ask for a donation in his soft board. <laughs> <dough. laughs> <laughs> it's so she, she on our actual audio podcast i have um a pre-roll segment that i recorded yeah, a long time it. ago that plays each time so that's what she's talking about then you get a little further in and the aggressive italian mafia guy <laughs> starts talking about how women can't drive and shouldn't be given the right to vote 100 true as a woman i oh 100 agree keep it going guys you guys are awful five stars oh that's so amazing i love that one Confusing, Dude, confused. A woman is driving. I think the Italian might be yeah, a bit touched. I hope Rob finds gainful employment. We read that one. So um, I I know the Return of the King guys left one. I guess it's not up yet. Did not they leave yet. it? On, did they leave it on Apple Podcasts? Is the question? Because a lot of people like we'll get YouTube comments. Dude, Jeff's here. I haven't seen Jeff in so long. Awesome. Holy cow, Jeff is here. I have not seen Jeff in so long. Um, Jeff, I gotta I gotta see if you're if you're not at seminary. Um, we're still doing that thing in September if you want to come. So, um, someone wants say? us to actually have a serious podcast tonight. It looks like just a light discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to hear about Nick's time in the, in the monastery. So you went, um, and now to the women's <laughs> driving fund. <laughs> Is this to help them learn how to drive? Is this to prevent them from driving? No, no, the accident help that latter cause. It's never going to work. It's the accident fund. The All accident the damage fund. They uh, you know, I make fun of my wife's driving all the time. You know what I did the other day? Did you hit the garage? I didn't hit the garage. I hit my boat trailer. Like I, I was going so slow because I didn't. I usually put my boat trailer like far back in my driveway so that I could fit my truck in the driveway with the boat trailer. And last time I used the boat, I must have not put it back as far, and I just misjudged it. I just barely touched it, but it left a nice gash in the. A good thing it's your uncle's vehicle. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jeff, you, you're going to come. I'll, I'll message you on uh, Telegram. I'll send you all the, all the info and stuff so you can come. Um, 
And then they're doing some, um, they're doing a, uh, so I was going to ask Raphael to go, but Raphael's going upstate New York. They're doing some procession that he's going to. So, but all right, Nick, tell us. So tell us about your 30 days in, in the penitentiary, bro. Yeah, no, for <laughs> real. It was, a, it was, a. I said this on, uh, yeah, Return of the King the other day, but uh, you hear the phrase thrown around like once in a lifetime trip, absolutely life changing. And it definitely was that trip for me. So I went, a lot of people asked, was I discerning? No, I'm not discerning any form of religious or priesthood um, at all. So that you can get that fear out of the way. I was never going to abandon and jump ship and never return again. Um, but I went with the idea of making a documentary about myself reading the whole of St. Thomas's Summa in 30 days in a monastic setting. Because, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the, I guess, the crux of my show, Thomism. And so I went to Clear Creek Abbey in Oklahoma. I, this was my eighth time going up, so I have a lot of relationships with the monks. And uh, what Nick, else? you have you have to tell you have to tell what you told us because there's yeah. like tra- you have to tell. Make sure you tell them what you told us in the green room. Oh, for sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it's quite interesting uh, about Mister Mister Thrice Charitable himself. Got brought Thrice up, Charitable got got, uh, got brought up a few times. Uh, by different people. But uh, yes, I went and somehow I managed to, it was like 10 hours a day of reading plus like the six or seven hours of liturgy, right? So we, you get up super early in the morning, usually like 4.50 AM. And then it's, you know, 5.15, you're down in the chapel. And this, you know, it's a massive monastery and it's built in a very old way, uh, old building techniques. They're wanting the monastery to actually survive a thousand years and so this monastery is part of the congregation of salem for those of you guys who know dom garange right dom garange was the founder of salem and so this is kind of one of the abbeys that is you know um if you will a child if you will of his movement and so it has about 60 monks you get up super early in the morning and you're doing the office of matins and then immediately following the office of louds and so it's about you know an hour and a half or an hour 45 of Gregorian chant, first thing in the morning. And then it immediately is followed by low masses in the crypt, the crypt of the church. And the crypt of the of the, of the church, I say church, it's more like a cathedral in size. There's about nine side altars. So you just see all the monks at these side altars whispering low masses. Very, very beautiful. That's awesome. and, and these monks, because they're so far removed from the world, they're going to, uh, yes, please, uh, that, that will is, be our mission in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Yeah, another Yankee to, to, to add on to my life, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so these monks are extremely holy, um, extremely penitential. Honestly, when you look at the monks, they all look like spiritual athletes, you know, shaved heads, um, extremely silent, keeping cuss of the eyes and living a very holy life. So was there so, so not like Alex Crow, Father Alex Crow with his Ooh. wavy long Ooh. hair and his nineties. Yeah, definitely not that world. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> definitely not that world. There I joined I came in on July seventeenth. Uh, I believe, yeah, it was July seventeenth. And July eighteenth was the I believe was the seven hundredth anniversary of St. Thomas Aquinas's canonization. So I started reading there in honor of him. And then through the course of the, the 30 days, I read through the entire of St. Thomas Summa from the beginning of the Prima Pars all the way to the last appendice at the supplement. And to say that I was um, so ignorant of the Catholic faith would be an understatement. Uh, when you finally get to see the whole breadth of the science that is the Catholic faith uh, in its full, pristine form laid you're out. Saying, you're saying thing. before you went into the monastery. Oh yeah, no. When in, in comparison, in comparison to what I know now by by reading the Summa, I knew nothing wow. <laughs> about about the Catholic faith. Which is funny all. because you're the traditional Thomist, so you have it's not like you're ignorant of Thomism. Like, but to go through the entire to, the, the entire Summa really shaped your mind that much. It shaped me. I I walked out of the monastery with four questions. Ultimately, four questions. The first one was, <clears throat> Do I even know God? Some of these questions were kind of um, almost like exasperating statements being thrown toward the heavens i first asked myself do i really know god because when you really sit down and you read through his tract on the one god and on the triune god you're just sitting there thinking 
do I know who this God is? Is this the God I really pray to? Is this the God that I kind of conceive, if you will, in my mind whenever I'm praying? Does the average Catholic in the pew, by the way that they're behaving, know who this God is? You know, you ask questions like that. Then I ask the question, do I even know how to pray? Because when you look and if you go, contemplate this divine being, you're going to ask yourself, like, do you even know how to approach this being? You know, like when you start to really meditate on who God is, do you even really know what it means to approach this being? The third one, <clears throat> the third question I asked myself was, do I even have or do I know how to practice the virtue of charity? Because going through the treatise on charity, you realize that that term, which is thrown around all the time on YouTube, I can tell you now definitively, no one knows what that means. <laughs> like next to no one knows what that means. When people just say be charitable, they're just basically saying don't cr criticize them or something at this point. Like it, it's not, it's don't not hurt my feelings. Don't hurt my feelings. It's not actually the virtue of charity. And then the last question I walked away with was, what am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm still working. Oh, okay. Um, well, you have to realize I'm being very careful because the last time you were on with me, it was just me and you. And Rob runs the comments when it's when it's all of us. Like Rob's always running the comments so that I could pay attention to the conversation. When me and you were on together last time, I was trying to pay attention to comments. And every time a comment would come up, I would barrel right over you and talk right over you. And you were so patient. Like I went back and watched that show and I'm like, holy cow. Every time this kid would be talking about something, I would just jump in or respond to it. It was the most, it's one of the most, I was I was very embarrassed of my behavior with you that day, but it wasn't because I wasn't listening. I was just trying to do too much at once. Hey, but, it, was, it wasn't a problem. Yeah, no, I was asking about, can you get, do you hear it, Rob, the, the audio interference thing? Yeah, and a lot of people are hearing it. it Is it like. mine? Me again? I think it might be on your end because I it, muted could, myself for a minute. Yeah, me and Nick were both muted for half, for a little while and it's still well, coming I'm through. I'm going to mute myself now. Ha, ah, we finally got him to mute himself, guys. Good job. That was a good one. You will be receiving your donations in the mail at the yep. end of the episode. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm tempted to speak in the third person about myself just to get that other $5 out of freaking Adrian. So. Let's see. You guys... So YouTube will take 30% and then you and I yeah, split it 50-50. So I'm, uh, I'm glad Steve's here because actually Steve uh, messaged me on Facebook. I have a couple Civil War style videos from the monastery, believe it or not, that you'll actually appreciate. That I speaking took, of uh, Steve, Steve, so. I just got this in the mail today. Thank you very much. Oh, speaking of Steve, Rob, don't you have something of Steve? Oh, yes. Yes. Hold on. Oh, we didn't play your, Steve. your music at the beginning. Oh, here, hold on, guys. Let me get it going. Old friend, I've come to talk with you again. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to he, talk he with will just you send again. Random audio serenading us like regularly like not not occasionally regularly like daily <laughs> i don't mind it <laughs> you know a mental case <laughs> I, you know i'm i'm kind of glad i don't know mr cunningham as well as you guys do at this point because i would just be, <laughs> i would just be like i don't know if i'm ready for this yet so. no dude he's, <laughs> he's, he's he's he just gets right in there steve you know i'll give you his number yeah <laughs> people give anybody his number he's a maniac um, all right. So wait, what was your fourth question? I didn't hear your fourth, your, fourth that you came out with. Fourth and final question I basically asked myself was, is what am I going to do with this faith? Because the Catholic faith, it, it's just one of the biggest things we take for granted is the fact that God has given us this absolutely beautiful gift. And I felt very much so like at the end of it, looking down at the Summa, just asking myself, like, what am I going to do with this? And I'll, and I'll tell this one story that I told on uh, return of the King, but <clears throat> There, it was like two days or something before the end of our of our uh, stay there, and I'm finishing up the summa. We go down for the office of vespers. We hear this, you know, beautifully chanted vespers, incense, everything, absolutely great. Um, but then they expose our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, and I hear Aquinas' hymns being sung after you know 30 days, 3,000 pages of being with the Master Himself. And I just remember in that moment tearing up and crying because I was just thinking like. Number one, it's just so beautiful, the fact that like 800 years later, I'm hearing this in front of the being whom he wrote all this about. But what am I going to do 
with this faith. I mean, like, you know, it's kind of like uh, Spider-Man talks about, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, with great knowledge comes great responsibility. Like, what are you going to do with this Catholic faith that you're giving you? It's a question for all of us. I'm not saying that everyone obviously has to understand every element of the Summa, but it's very important for us to understand that every single thing that we do learn, we do have the obligation to pass it on. That's why I finally walked away fully understanding Archbishop Lefebvre's statement of I have passed down what I have received. I understand now to a degree what that means. Like when you receive the pure Catholic faith given to you, not a Catholic faith where you have to like, you know, dig through a thousand and one different things and try to understand what the heck can this possibly mean in an orthodox light. And I was formed on YouTube and podcasts and some random books. That's my formation. No, that's not the formation of the Catholic faith. When you're given the entire Catholic faith in a very beautiful setting, in a monastic setting, you're given it, uh, given it to it in a scholastic format. You just walk away saying, I want everyone to know this. And so those are the big takeaways. People will see this in the documentary. I film kind of more of my more in-depth thoughts about it. But yeah, it was absolutely um, amazing. Well, one thing I took away from our conversation with Trent Horn is that modern Catholics, most of us have not read anything from before the notes. Like I've, I've read a few encyclicals from the popes. I've read Pachendi. I've read, like I've read a few, but like most of us don't really read pre-council stuff. And it's, and I just saw, um, I think it, may, it might have been Kennedy posting a couple of excerpts from, from some pre-council stuff. And it's like the church, I think it might have been, I don't know if it was Pius XII or Pius X. He was, he was posting like quotes from him. Well, maybe it was even something from Vatican, but whatever it was. It was, it was Pius X, uh, sacred music. No, I think it was something from Vatican I on evolution. That I, the, the specific thing I'm talking about. So I don't know. I don't know who it was, but it was like there was a time when the church understood her role as an authority in teaching, where it seems like she's so unsure of herself now and tiptoes around difficult subjects because she doesn't want to offend anyone. And she's constantly trying to maneuver in ways to make the world think we're not so mean. Don't worry. And it's really it, it's it's pretty it's it's just jarring to read things from before the council and to sit and read the entire summa must have been like like what do you how do you think that's going to affect your prayer life like like are you going to what do you what's going to change about your prayer life after this this 30 days oh it, it's in completely changed i so i still often ask myself those four questions but the questions that i now like come to the lord in prayer with it's so different because now I, in a certain sense, understand my obligation to him, right? One of the things that I just, I was thinking about this earlier, like I say this with all due respect to Protestants that I know, but Protestantism, at least in the evangelical form that it's presented, at least as it was presented to me, is such a cheap bill of goods because the God that I was taught whenever I was a kid was very much so a God of you know, he gives you what you want if you behave in a good way. And that's about it, right? He's kind of just there to fulfill all of your earthly temporal desires. That's obviously a very shallow form of probably what most evangelicals would say. So I don't want to lump them all in together and say that that's what it is. But when you understand whom St. Thomas says, number one, God is, and then number two, you are, and then number three, your obligations to him. But then you realize you're inability to even fulfill those obligations except fourthly through the person of christ and then through the sacraments given to you um it will change your whole life so how it's affected my prayer life is that i recognize that even in the midst of this absolutely insane time that we live in in the church i now have and this was not present uh, a month and a half ago but i now have great confidence right i'm, I'm expectant i am expectant of great things of a great god I do believe that God is going to do very great things because he is a very great God. And those things are all going to be for the, um, you know, honor of his name and for our own benefit, right? At the end of the day. Yeah, no, exactly. It was a, it was to a degree, a, a idea genie. of, of, uh, you, do, of you do, you think of God as a genie when, when, in a very shallow sense. It's like, you know, when, when bad times cut, like a lot of people don't realize when, when things are going good, it's sometimes it's 
that's the easiest time to put God to the side because things are going good. But when times get rough, all of a sudden you're leaning on God, but you're also using him as a genie or, you know, please, God, just answer my prayer. And it, it's a it's a it's a scary thing to fall into for all of us. I think it's a danger for all of us to fall into. Yeah, no, fully agree. I've always been better at contemplative prayer than oral prayer like then like I, I, i've always been good at just like pondering god pondering mysteries of in scripture things like that more so than like repetitive prayer i've, I've always had a hard time with the rosary i have to force it i still do it but i force it and i can't meditate while I, I have always had a hard time meditating on the mysteries while i'm praying the rosary but if i just think about the mysteries i can really contemplate the mysteries it's a strange thing right. for me yeah, sure. No, I get that. I think it sometimes it is just maybe a certain amount of like, you know, multitasking, doing trying to do two things at one time, which can be a bit of a challenge. I think for me, though, like how I really fall in love with the rosary is that in each mystery, really contemplating through the mystery itself, God's love for mankind to where I'm praying the rosary, but it's almost like I'm forgetting where I'm at. You know, it's kind of hard to describe something I, quite beautiful. I usually look at praying the rosary as not so much meditating on the mysteries as just sitting in Our Lady's presence. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and just just really developing a, a love and relationship yeah. with Our Lady more than like I know people have said it's like you're, you're looking at the life of Christ through the eyes of Our Lady, where I really just want to spend that time with Our Lady. So when I'm saying the, the Hail Mary, sometimes my mind drifts. But I'm really always I just feel like I'm wrapped in her mantle as I'm praying it, you know, but so. All right. So you got there. Um, what was the hardest part about being there? Sure. Yeah. Let me uh, answer this question real quick. Oh, go uh, ahead. Yeah. yeah. Paul, that's the question. I'm sorry. How, like, so, uh, yeah. When you first, attempt to read. first, Mr. Paul, you're uh, not retarded. Um, <laughs> it, it's Aquinas. You know, you got to understand he is writing a basically a, a master slash doctorate style work for. 12th century theologians, the theology students who have already mastered most of Aristotle's corporal works. So, you know, don't feel bad, right, for, for worrying about that. But I'd say best thing to really get into Aquinas, I'd, I'd say I'd have to probably know your, your um, depth, depth of exposure to just philosophy and theology in general, because again, I don't necessarily recommend someone just pick up the Summa if they have no philosophical background whatsoever. But I would say, if you're wanting to learn things, good basic places to start off with. I don't necessarily endorse everything that this organization does, but I do endorse this portion. The Thomistic Institute has a great series of free lectures on each larger, broader section of the Summa, um, which I think is very, very good. Um, another good work um, that you might enjoy to begin with is a book called The Summa, The Summa by Dr. Peter Kreeft. That was actually my, one of my first books. It's actually somewhere back over there. Um, but it was one of my first books on the Summa. But I'd also say, like, you know, if you're really serious about Aquinas, just dive in. Don't expect to understand it all. Um, you know, kind of gradually work up to getting it. Eventually, if you're really wanting to be invested in it, you're going to want to go to the Thomist school itself. So Cajetan's commentaries, Boulard's commentaries, John of St. Thomas, Gergou Lagrange, etc. But leave that for, for many years after practice. Can I just say something real quick? Because that is not the first time Short Farrell has given us $100. So, like, that's not the first time. She's done it a few times. <laughs> like, I think we owe Nick 50 of the last 100. Shut up. Because it was the band. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, the last time Nick was on, she did. Is yeah, it, no, you, I, I you, can keep, you guys can keep that. Hardest thing, though, to answer your question, Anthony, the hardest thing about being in the monastery, there was one day <clears> – <throat> One day where I, I think it was like day 10 or something where I think it really just cr like crashed in. Like I've been, I felt like I've been here forever and I'm going to be here for forever. Um, what am what I day do? was this day 10? I think it was like day 10 or something day, day nine or 10, somewhere in there. And what happened was I, it was, so I'll, I'll open to, up to you guys a little bit about this. So before going on the trip, I had a friend of mine who um, let's just put it this way. I, I had to. Um, yeah, I just, I just had a very difficult conversation that, that could have taken place, but that just didn't take place with, a, with a particular friend of mine. And it was, it was really bothering my conscience. And it was something where I, I was just really missing this particular friend. I was really wanting the Lord to move in this particular friend's life. And 
I was just very, very sad. And so kind of being there day 10, a lot of these kind of sad emotional feelings kind of welled up uh, to a degree. Um, but then you're I was a very, off. You're a very stoic person. Um, like you don't, you're not, you're not like me. Like I'm very sentimental. So for, for this, that, all right. So this is a friend. Did you, did you have something bad happen between you at, a, at some point? Yeah, it was, well, I would say ultimately it was just a miscommunication and it was kind of a willful choice on their part to just not communicate and kind of have an adult conversation that needed to be taken. And I, I so it's interesting. I am very stoic in my uh, appearance. And I can be very stoic in the way I handle myself, but I do feel things very deeply. So my, because you guys, I, I like that you guys like this when it comes to the temperaments. My temperament is choleric melancholic, right? And is that so, you, Rob? No. Wait. And so, oh, you're not. You're, no, that, you're. I'm that's sorry, Jason. Yeah. Choleric melancholic is Jason. So uh, I'm, yeah, because the choleric is the no nonsense. Kind of a holeish. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I have that in me. I, mean, I, I got that in me. I would say, yeah, there's definitely moments where I can have my dander up, if you will, and it's not very good. Um, but I feel things also very deeply. And so I was very kind of sad about this. And <clears throat> I was also very sad because sometimes I judge myself a little bit too harshly. Um, I think I look at myself and I ask myself questions like, you know, should I be further ahead in life? Should I be doing X, Y, or Z? Uh, when it comes to like pursuing a career, should I be, you know, should I be married by now? Should I already have children by now? You know, why am I kind of, you know, 25 reading through 3000 pages in the middle of the woods in this monastery for a month, you know, kind of asking myself these questions. And I had a friend who was there with me, uh, you know who you are, and he was giving me a lot of encouragement. But also what really helped me, though, was I think this is arguably the hardest thing about being Catholic what I'm about to say, the absolute hardest thing is learning how to suffer well. That is the hardest thing. <clears throat> it's something that like terrified me when I had to read it, but it was so cool. I was in my meditations. I love to meditate over St. Alphonsus Liguori's meditations. And I was reading, th I just happened to open one that day on suffering well. And it was talking about this real reality of like, you know, if God is good, and does allow suffering for our benefit, then how can we really in justice say like, you know, how dare you, if you will. And he quoted from one of the saints, which said something to the effect of, you know, if it was God's will for me to be placed in hell temporarily, you know, who am I to say no? And of course you can take that in a very strict sense or very like literal sense or, or more mystical. Well, but I took it in the sense of like, I need to know what it means to suffer well. So well that that's, was what just, that's what I want to ask you. Like, what do you, all right, so... To get into the understanding of suffering well, because I try to never complain. Um, yeah. <clears throat> like, like if I have a miserable day at work, something like that, like I, I try to bear it and not complain about it. But are there ways that you learned to suffer well that maybe are beyond the surface level of something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my friend here, the Roman Baron, that's true. I also learned to suffer well by drinking wine soup because... Wine <clears throat> soup? Yeah, it's a French custom for, uh, being uh, from the Congregation of Salims. They'll they'll give you soup that is like a, a, a sweet red wine. And uh, about three gulps after that, I was like, okay, I cannot drink this anymore. I'm going to die. But yeah, what I've learned, what does it mean to suffer well? So we no one naturally wants to suffer. We all naturally tend toward and desire the good. Now, yeah. the good, the objective good is God because all things, all existence, all being, all reality flows from him who is absolute necessity, who is absolute being itself, who is in pure actuality. So God, I mean, you just think of something like this. I've been meditating on this today. The concept of existence, right? Where does existence come from? It has to come from God because it's like this. When we ask our question, ourselves questions like, okay, where does existence, the idea of existence itself come from? We're naturally seeking with our intellect the cause of this greater effect. But then we understand, okay, this, everything that is just existence or existence itself has to come from a being who is necessary and who is outside of existence, who just is, whose existence is his own essence, who is existence itself. So when you understand that we tend, that we're, that that's who God is and that God did not have to make you, he did not have to make you at all, but that he made you, purely out of the desire to share his goodness with you. 
the objective goodness, the sh- and goodness not just being, you know, what you get, like a good spouse or children or a good uh, a good good life. You know, it is himself he wants to share with you, and that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful that that is whom he wants to sh- that that's what is going to satisfy. That's why nothing on this earth will satisfy. So if we're made for goodness itself, but we live in a fallen world because of our own sin, because of our own fallen choices, then what does it mean to suffer well? It means that everything that God wills for us, right, even if it's painful, is ultimately going to be um, used to bring a greater good from it. And practically, how that works is its major humility. That's the first step, major humility, that we are not God right? It's very hard that we're not God and that we're not in control. And this is what is um, very much so something that destroys our pride, especially as men who want to be in control of our lives, who want to be the founders of our own destiny, especially as Americans who are very much so influenced by classical liberalism and uh, uh, self-independence, etc., that we do not even have our own existence or being except from the person of God who freely wills it so that you can be with him. So we first have to recognize that. Second thing, we have to, in humility, recognize that we have to have total dependence upon God with both our intellect and our will. So we first have to know with our intellect, okay, Lord, I am fully reliant on you. And then most importantly, we have to choose to be fully reliant on you, which means, okay, Lord, in this situation where I'm like tempted to strike out, I have to be modest. I have to have humility. I have to practice um, you know, kindness and meekness. I have to do these types of actions right here. And you also have to understand that while your emotions may be kicking and screaming and fighting these lower appetitive bodily passions, those things right, are always going to be there screaming at you. But it, it only depends on what is your intellect and your will. Are they going to say, calm down and go this way? And so that's what I would recommend is it's, you have to have humility, you have to submit, and then practically how it plays out, keeping the commandments. Right. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I, I I'm I'm coming up on something in my life that I know is going to <clears throat> I'm going to have to learn middle to, age crisis. Well, no, it's <laughs> I'm going to have to learn to. Uh, it, it's like the little humiliations are really important because our pride is so annoying. Mm-hmm. But I know something's coming up that I'm going to have to like like it, it might be like a little bit of a public human not nothing with the show like with my family i'm i'm gonna have to deal with like a little bit Call of colonoscopy oh man I, i'm gonna have to go get the i'm gonna have to get the, the check soon right i'm 40 but you have to go get checked it's like 45 40. or 50 yeah i don't want to do that that's humiliating too but no it's just something that i'm going to be dealing with soon and it's like to to just swallow your pride and just accept a humbling uh from god is is difficult and it's i think those are those are times where you really like suffering well is not just about not complaining it's not just about you have a backache you you know you you endure it it's really the public humiliations like you really think of christ having having getting spit on before the sanhedrin and not saying anything yeah and think of it this way i again i don't know what your situation is but just think of it this way this is a moment of god continuing the salvation in your life because it could be that very pride which could damn your soul. That's why. That's just why when we recognize how good God is, that this pride that we have inside of us can flare up and can control our lives, that what God is saying like, hey, this is going to be hard, but this is going to save your soul. And that's that's a beautiful reality. And that's something that it's like if we do recognize like, okay, I exist not because of any necessity. Notice this, that God did not have to create any of us to be happy because he was lonely because he was bored because he had nothing to do he was perfectly and is perfectly and for always for all ages will be perfectly content with himself completely content with himself completely happy how much more happy than you can be with happiness itself with joy itself but yet he chose to freely share in his goodness by creating you by by redeeming you and by sanctifying you right and so if he's choosing to sanctify you in this way He's giving you a bit of his goodness and you know, it's going to be great. Whatever, whatever problem you're going through, it's going to be joyous whenever you leave, because you're going to walk away with one, the temporal situation is done, but then two, spiritually, you've been uplifted and you've grown. So when I I told the story about um, me having a fight with my brother-in-law 
at my sister's going away party. Like my sister went down to become a passionist. Yeah, I know this story. Yeah, I know this so story. I felt, that's right. You, you are. So I felt not so awful. much actual brother in law, right? Like right. He's my sister's baby daddy. Baby daddy. Um, but I I remember after calling my sister the next day and just feeling so awful. And I'm like, I'm like, I that was your night, and it should have been all about spending that time with my sister and it should have the whole night should have been about her. And instead I selfishly like that, nah, look at me and rah, I got to make a scene. And my sister said to me, she was Anthony, I'm not mad at you. I love you. I just worry for your soul. And to hear that from someone like her, like your initial instinct when you hear that from somebody is don't judge me. And I had to really sit and think about it. And I'm like, if my sister who's, so much holier than I am as seeing something in me that I'm not seeing. Like I need to shut up. Like, and I need to listen to this. And I, I think anytime somebody like makes an accusation at one of us, our initial instinct is don't judge me, but we really do have to, in those moments, really try to listen to what the person is mad at and what they're saying, because that judgment, another person, they, you know, we always say, Oh, you know, don't point the speck out in the other side when you have a log in your own. But when somebody's mad at you or somebody says something to you, it's easy for the other person to judge you because they see something you don't see. And then you don't want to see in yourself. Notice how, uh, so St. Thomas taking this from, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 11. He talks about how, you know, wisdom is one of the uh, gifts of the Holy ghost, right? The spirit of wisdom. And what does the book of Proverbs say? Proverbs talks about how it's a wise man who listens to the rebuke of another person, right? I remember my mom, she would use verses like that all the time growing up, is that, you know, she would have to correct us. And me and my younger sister, we would get so upset, so frustrated internally. But she would always quote those things to us, but they stuck with me. But I, what I recognize is it's like, yeah, in those moments, yeah, like you're talking about, if you have a very holy sister who's telling you, you know, Anthony, I'm worried for your soul or, or something to that effect. You know, listen, you know, absolutely listen. It could be the voice of God. You know, yeah. I am reminded of that passage. I think it's in Luke chapter 11 or Luke chapter 12, where it's the, do you guys, do you guys remember this passage where it's the covetous man? Our Lord warns people of the covetousness. And what he does is he tells the parable of the man who builds great barns, right? Think of it this way, though. Our barns might be our platforms here on YouTube or our social standings in public. So he builds great barns and he has so he says he has so much fruit that he says, I don't even know where to put it all. There's so much fruit. And so he says, I know what I'll do. I'll build even greater barns. And what does God say? He said he comes to him that night and says, Thou fool, this night thy soul will be required of thee. And then who will these things be which you've made, right? Which you've provided. And so he says that that is what will happen to all people who are covetous and not rich toward God, right? Where our heart is, there are treasure ours also. So we always have to remember that whether it's these platforms, whether it's like me going and making this documentary or study, right? Like when we're studying these things, are we doing them for the glory of God and for union with God? Or are we going to just do them to build up ourselves? And let's all be honest. Let's all be honest. There is a massive temptation on YouTube, to build ourselves up, to make this our empire. And that we have, we have to, we have to echo this phrase, let our name, whatever your name is X, right. Disappear, but the, let the name of Jesus Christ be glorified. That has to be our ultimate goal. Yeah. I constantly question my motives for doing this constantly. It's like, what, what do you, what, what is your real, like, is it because you want the attention because you want, when you go to church, you want people to recognize you like what, why, what are my motivations for doing this? I, I think they are just, I really do enjoy doing, I love having these conversations because there's no other place for me to really have them. I don't have many other Catholic friends in my real life. And I really do love having these conversations. A lot of us uh, has just stopped answering the phone too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the other is I want to, I want to tone some of the negativity down that I think is on Catholic YouTube. Cause I think so much of it is negativity. Um, but I don't know what my secret motives are because I think sometimes we convince ourselves there are things like that, but deep down you do want the glory. And it's, a, it's a scary thing. Like I, I, ne I never want, I never, it, like if I'm going to lose my soul over this, like God, don't ever let it grow. Let some, let the ca channel get canceled. I don't care about the channel. Like it, my soul comes first. So if this is going to lead to some form of pride that needs to be rooted out. I don't want it to grow. 
Sure. And just always be discerning because sometimes what happens is that like whatever maybe starts off in a negative way, God can use for good, right? He can always take, make great good out of evil and maybe just sometimes be diligent with the will. So it's like maybe, maybe on one day, your initial desire is to kind of glorify yourself in some way. Well, you know, say an act of contrition and choose with the will. No, Lord, this is yours. Move on. You know, it's always a good idea. Like I, what I always do is every time I get, I don't talk about this often, but like every time I go before an interview, I always pray because I do genuinely want to just kind of be hidden because like there is nothing good about me. I mean, I appreciate, for instance, like everyone's comments, they're, they're very, very nice comments, but trust me, all glory goes to Christ because I am just a dumb, dumb kid. I'm just a dumb kid. Like I was exposed to Aquinas's writings. If like any man is, is great, it would be Aquinas. But what would Aquinas say? All that I have written is a straw in comparison to the beatific vision. Like it's like what Philippians talks about when St. Paul says like, whatever is good, whatever is holy, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is et cetera, right? Think on these things. Well, who is that? It's God himself. That's the only thing that's good. And that's, I don't know. That's just what I feel. I just feel love. You know, I just feel the love of God whenever I think about these things. This reality, it's like, wow, God has given me these absolutely beautiful things, you know, and he has this for everybody. It's not, it's not unique to me. Yeah. Look, I, uh, just from that comment that person put up, like, um, like we do really try hard. Like uh, we had Trent Horn on the other day and I, I explained this already. It's like, I, I wasn't going to bring Trent on and trash him. I wasn't going to bring Trent on and have an argument with him. I disagree with Trent on a lot of things. But I do. But like, if somebody I think is a, is a is a a good Catholic, uh, like is has has goodwill, I'm going to speak to them in goodwill, and I'm going to try to develop a friendship or at least a positive relationship with them. Somebody accused me of kissing his ass, and I said, like, go back and watch our Keith Nestor conversation. Go back and watch. Like, I'm always like that with people. I try to always build somebody up that I bring on, and and just make them feel like like. Uh, like they're not just some fly by guest. Like I never want anybody to feel like that. I want whoever I'm talking to to know I'm engaged with that conversation. And we try to be a little more positive on this channel. Um, Nick, did you ever watch the show Alone? Alone. I don't think so. Is this a TV show? Maybe? Yeah. So it's, it's a reality show where um, they pick 10 contestants and they go out into like the Alaska wilderness. And it's right at the end of summer. So. They go out alone, legit alone, every contestant. They get a plot and they have like GoPros and they have motion sensor cameras. So they're mm -hmm. filming themselves. There's no film crew there, nothing. They are legit alone. And when you watch these people alone out in the wilderness, the first week they're, they're you know, usually just trying to get a shelter set up and they're trying to figure out how I'm going to get food. But once they start getting into the long duration, by day 20, the heartache sets in of loneliness. Mm, yeah. And that's what you, you, that's why I was kind of reminded of that when you said like, because sometimes people like demons come up when you spend that time alone and in prayer. So it's like these things from your past will come up. And I think for you, it was that thing with your friend that was kind of hanging over you. Was there anything else that like, just from having that time in solitude that really struck you that like, you didn't think you would like you that hit your mind where you're like, Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I would agree with the, your your guys' fans. Your guys' show is top notch. Uh, it's so oh, thank you, man. <laughs> it, it really is because it's like it's not an echo chamber. It has great guests from varying perspectives on, and it's a great fun conversation. And so I love it. But yeah, good question. I so this is what's interesting. <laughs> it's a breath I, of something. <laughs> this is the Protestant too much. Yeah, this is not Protestant. Bro. I, listen, one day he's going to convert and we're going to hear his conversion story. So, but yeah. I'm glad he's here for this conversation because Nick is a, is a, is, is about to impart some wisdom on us. Well, I was going to say, so I, you know, I don't know if this is just partially temperament, but God has given me a lot of grace to be very introspective. And so while I was at the monastery, I, I'm a very introspective person naturally, but at the monastery, I knew I was going to continue that. And so I was, you know, what's interesting in the bottom of the monastery, there's again, there's this crypt, right, where it has all these altars and has our, our blessed Lord there. It has actually some really cool relics, some of them from uh, Golgotha itself, right? I can't remember them all right now. So, um, but the Roman Baron, if you're still in the chat, you maybe can put like what those relics were. Um, we can talk a little bit about them later. Um, but I was just there were there was times where I was fearful in a certain sense to go down with nothing but silence for a really long time. Because I know the difference between like when the devil is throwing my sins in my face versus true conviction. 
But I'll be honest with you, that room, which I, I remember thinking for the longest time that that room would kind of basically be like a prison of introspection. It's, it's darker. It's colder. You're kneeling on the floor. It's very quiet. There's nothing aesthetically not, pleasing in there, right? I mean, there, there are some things, but it, it's not a cathedral. You know, it's, it's very plain. No, it's I'm not, saying in your, like in your room where you were staying, right? Like, weren't you staying, were you sharing a room or were you? Yeah, no, so I was, I was in a room in the guest wing of the monastery. Um, but this prayer time, yeah, it's spent in the crypt at the very bottom of the building. And I remember thinking like that this room in a certain sense could be basically be like a cell of introspection, just something very, very tough and dark. And I remember every time that I've gone to the monastery up until this time, I've always been in a certain sense, kind of somewhat spiritually intimidated by going into this room in front of Christ. Um, not, and, and I realized that so much of that was not even necessarily conviction, but condemnation from past sins. But I'll be honest with you this time after reading, especially the treatise on the incarnation, knowing who Christ was, that room became a joyous experience. Yeah. Because now I was throwing myself upon my knees in front of God, who I've been reading about, right, all this time. And he knows me perfectly. And, th and the fact, again, that he has willed me into existence, not out of necessity. No one's twisting God's arm, but that he has given me life. And then he has given me new life. And that he is sanctifying me currently. That room became, if you will, basically a, a chamber of love. Almost like the Song of Solomon talks about, where... My heart was, in a certain sense, um, united to the Sacred Heart in in total fixation. And yeah, there were times where I I I, I honestly can say that I I kind of forgot who I was and forgot what was going on around me because I was so kind of transfixed in the love of Christ. And I just think it's a, it's something very beautiful. And I and I'll be honest, I don't think a lot of people we hear this phrase, you know, the love of God all the time in the church. But people, unless you unless you heed to the, what the Holy Ghost is telling you to put down your sins and to put down your phones and to put down the distractions of modern life and wrestle with God like Jacob, our patriarch father, did right in the book of Genesis, wrestle with him in prayer, you'll find him. And then you'll get to start to see him face to face. He's there, right? Some of us may have to wrestle. Some of us may just have to be, you know, it's a simple knock that the book of the apocalypse talks about where Christ says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? He could be knocking on your heart. Let him in, right? Whatever it is. I'm not saying that you're supposed to have this gargantuan, you know, lightning bolt moment where you just get instantly transformed, but he's there just acknowledging the fact that he is here, that he is in all the rooms that we're talking and right now, and then he wills all of us into existence. It was moments like that where I was afraid, but God took that fear, um, that holy fear, which is good, but he turned it into a holy filial fear, uh, a loving fear, you know, of not wanting to offend him and just wanting to be totally united to him. And I think that that's what's very good. I'm really envious that you have the freedom to spend 30 days in a place like that because just finding time to have like some solitude, like with the noise of life turned off because these distractions are so bad. They're just so bad. I mean, I, f I find myself, it's, it's crazy because I work a 13 hour, 14 hour day at work. Then I get home and I got my kids and my wife. And then I have, it, it is just so much going on. It's like, when do you get time to just sit in silence with God? Like, I really think retreats are something we should we really have to make time to just go, and, and even adoration to just sit in front of the blessed sacrament for an hour once a week or something is like um, uh, Margo is asking about the uh, the Strickland story, which is in the title. Do you guys want to start that now or do you want to save that for locals and keep talking we can, about we can start if, that in a second? If Here's we don't do that on YouTube, I'm going to have to rename this whole video. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can do it in a second. This can be the last thing. So that that picture right there, that oh. was a picture of the crypt. That I'm referring to. So this is at the very bottom of the monastery. And um, what's so cool is you see the monks right there kneeling. I will promise you guys this when you go there, the holiness of the monks is so convicting because those monks are on their knees by free choice for three or four hours just sitting there. And sometimes it's not the blessed sacraments exposed. Sometimes our Lord is hidden right in the tabernacle. But that room, most of the time, that's the most light that you'll ever see. Most of the time, the room is very, very dark. It's just the light from the stained glass windows that comes in. And so it was something very, very um, worrisome in a certain sense, but again, became a chamber of love. And my friend here, the Roman Baron, he talks about, right, 
the relics that are here, uh, if you go over a little bit to the left, Rob, in the photo, I don't know if you can drag it, but if you go to the left, you see that little table. It's not exposed right now, but that little table hosts some relics uh, that's usually displayed on there. And it is, as you can see here, right, relics such as the stone from Golgotha, the veil of Our Lady, the cloak of St. Joseph, and the tomb of Christ, right? Different relics um, that are related to that. And so absolutely amazing relics you so, know? so this isn't the room where they uh where they have the private masses though right like that's up in this is this is the room yeah and so it's it's uh we're this photo is being taken from basically the um altar rail and so but the uh so if you can see here on the on the left and the right you see kind of those archways They're there are side arch altars. yeah so there's archways that are behind where this photo is being taken from uh, approximately eight of them along the walls and so that's where the monks will oftentimes say mass there's there's masses up in the main church as well there's masses here on this altar as well and uh, so they all, all go and so you guys have um morning morning prayer right at like 4 30 you got to get up yeah, so Matins and Louds, and then immediately after that, Low Mass. Then there's about 30 minutes. So of the, but prayer. the Low Mass is where they go and all say their private Masses, right? All say their private Masses. You can go to them um, as well. But that's what something that's very Were cool. you going to them every day? Yeah, so I was going. Uh, so we went to two Masses per day. So we went to the Low Mass, and then at 8 o'clock is the Office of Prime. 10 o'clock is the Office of Terrace and High Mass. So we got... High mass every single day for for thirty days, which was not con celebrated. No. <laughs> it was one priest would say high mass. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and, which is probably pretty beautiful for the for the priests themselves that they get to attend mass and not have to offer it. Right? I would think that's a, that's a special thing for them. Yeah, because it, it's what's happening is it's the community coming together to offer the sacrifice right through the one priest. Of course, it's offering it, but it's on behalf of the entire community. And yeah, that's correct. There's about 20 25 priests or so and about 40 40 ish lay brothers um yeah it, it's an amazing now, now do those lay brothers uh, have they taken vows are they there for life so most of them are uh there for life have taken permanent vows there is and no uh, and no desire to become priests yeah, no desire to become priests. We actually, we met a, a gentleman, uh, you guys can all pray for him. His name is Phil. He was actually a choir monk. Choir monks are monks who are destined for the priesthood. He was a choir monk for about a year and discerned out of that and decided to discern just being a lay brother. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people who, who think that like when it comes to monastic life in the context of men, it's like, oh, I have to be a priest. Not at all. Actually, in fact, what I love so much is the silent witness of the lay brother who is doing nothing else but just work and prayer. He, yeah. And, you know, it, both are absolutely, absolutely important to the monastery. But it, what I just found is like, for instance, I have a friend. His name is David. Pray for him. Brother David Marie. He joined about a year ago and I got to talk to him for about 45 minutes in the in the 30 day stay and getting to see the joy and love that he has had. Right. A kid who went to modern day and, you know, he was just kind of like, you know, a Gen Z troll, you know, kind of a funny guy, you know, essentially yeah. a year ago. I talked to him this September. The dude's already a saint. Like the the dude the, the dude's so filled with the joy of the Lord, it's absolutely crazy. Did you get to spend time with the monks? Like, did you get to like have fraternity with these guys? Where you guys got to like having dinner at night? Where you get to talk, or was dinner cool. silent? So all meals are according to strict silence. There is a reader who is who is reading a very spiritual or historical work. Um, so we do eat with them. There are long prayers chanted before and after. Um, and then there is a little bit of time where you get to talk to the guest master and, a, and maybe Father Pryor who comes out. I got to talk to the abbot, mm -hmm. Abbot Anderson, extremely holy man. For the first time, got to talk to him for about 10 minutes or so. Um, but most of the monks know. So most of them, you can you can work with them every single day. But according they, they try to follow the rule of St. Benedict very strictly. And so according to the rule of St. Benedict, you know, unless your conversation in work time is about the work that is being done, then or, or just kind of like, you know, what is your name or something? Outside of that, you know, don't talk. So they don't have like free time where they get to just. They have they, they have about 30 to 45 minutes of recreation, but it's with themselves. It's not with the world. Because, again, it's like they are cultivating a true spirit of asceticism away from the world. And I understand this fully because, you know, I know I'm supposed to be married. Going on this trip, I walked away knowing I was supposed to be married. Um, but I did. I do remember telling uh, a friend of mine, I said, like, if I was ever supposed to be monastic, I know that I would absolutely have to be separated from, you know, secular dudes or, um, and I fully agree with this. Absolutely. Um, 
and definitely away from from young ladies because like when you're in that world and you're really trying to to pursue Christ those things become major distractions for the for the moment so but yeah anyway but if you guys want to we can yeah we'll, we'll get into but, that i just wait one, so i know you couldn't spend do they they don't even hang with each other like for a half hour a day huh no no they do they do so recreation yeah they they hang out with each other for okay uh, with each other not alone most recreation for monks is going to be taking long walks together um there, were, there was some uh younger monks who uh, they would go out into a larger field and play soccer with each other. And so they're playing full habits and they're, you know, most of their, you know, soccer goals are going to be a bench or something like that. And so, but that's really it. It's going to be very wholesome and uh, not worldly at all. And then when that bell rings, you know, you go to the office, you know, yeah. our Lord is summoning you to the office. And so you go, yeah, you Abbot, Abbot Anderson, he's done a phenomenal job because it, it's like, he is a old school benedictine monk and so it's like he knows that that is the way to run things and the the proof is in the pudding he has yeah. so many vocations that they've already opened up a new monastery in new mexico I mean, and imagine being that and, abbot and just like cultivating saints like that absolutely we i heard a sermon of his uh i recorded and uh, it was on the subject of holy matrimony and about specifically and again this is what's so good about holy monks they're not afraid to preach the truth when it's time to preach or give you like when we went to confession with them, I would go to confession every week. The confessions are completely out of this world. They're, 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 they're preaching many homilies to you about uniting your, like picturing your, when you go into confession with them. Yeah. Tell me about this. I want to hear this. When you go into confession with them, it's this, I don't want to make this sound hyperbolic. Cause I'm, what I'm about to say, it, it's treading on some very holy ground, but it's like going to Golgotha. Because the priest is not, you know, just kind of listening to you like, oh, yeah, okay, good job. Yeah, okay, for your penance, do X. It's nothing like that. It's, you know, how does this affect the heart of Mary? How does this affect the heart of the beloved disciple? You know, what is it like to confess this sin as if you were looking up upon the cross, right? And what is truly your amendment of life going to be? And it's not harsh. It's extremely gentle, but it's extremely convicting. And then to hear, you know, ego te absolve upon you, you know, you're forgiven. And then you walk out. But the reflections that they give you, I remember one of the monks just basically asking me the question that our Lord posed to the disciples. Whom do you say that I am? That is really the question we have to ask ourselves every day, if not multiple times a day. Is he truly Christ, the Son of the living God, the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords? I love the, the collect for tomorrow. Yeah, St. Saint, uh, Saint, uh, Louis the Ninth. It basically beseeches, it thanks God for his life, but then it beseeches that like we, or like him rather, like St. Louis the Ninth, we can accompany this earthly king into going into the court of the King of kings. That is who Christ is. And so is he truly your king? Is he truly your Lord or not? Our Lord says in, right, it's a uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? If you love me, keep my commandments. And so going with them into confession, it was not a beating over the head, but it was a real look at the inner life of the soul. And then when you proceed and you go out from there, you want to change, right? You want to change. And it's very, very different. And, and what's so beautiful about all of this is, again, this is just doing, and this is a perfect segue into talking about Bishop Strickland, is that these monks are doing the things that the church has just always done. This is the good fruit of the old evangelization. What the church has always done and what the true church will continue to always do to the end of time until our Lord comes again. And so last thing I'll say about the monastery is that the good abbot gave a great sermon about holy matrimony, but it was not, you know, kind of just like a theoretical examination of the subject. It was holy matrimony is under major attack by the devil. We know this, right? We know this from people like, for instance, uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen, right? Talked a little good about him out that, about this great battle between God and the devil over this issue. It's been the fight since the Garden of Eden, right? The devil has always wanted to insert himself. I, I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking the rainbow stuff is the battle over marriage and the family, and it's not. The battle over marriage and the family is within Christian marriage. It's within Catholic yeah married couples the devil is trying to rip those couples apart it's easy to destroy exactly. marriage in the secular world it's us 
the rainbow movement is nothing more than the fruit of the destruction of true marriage that has already been going a long time, whether it be through contraception, no fault divorce, which needs to be talked about way, way more. And then this is the fruit of it. And so there is a, a ploy to destroy the family and through the family to destroy the children. And so this is what the Holy Abbot was talking about. How do we fight this? Right? How do we fight this? The great practical thing we can do, I truly believe, and not everyone can do this first portion. I believe everyone who is able needs to move to great places like this. Because I'll tell you, Anthony, when you're living in a, in a world where everyone around the monastery, the lay faithful, are all Catholic. Like everyone around is Catholic. It's like St. Mary's, Kansas, but just smaller. That's Christendom. And the faith yeah. makes so much sense. You have the intellectual knowledge of Aquinas, the daily liturgy in the office, and then the, the natural fellowship of the faithful. When you go to St. Mary's, Kansas, or you go to this place in Oklahoma, the kids are extremely courteous. They're calling you, you know, yes, sir, no, sir. What can I do for you, Sue? Everyone's dressed modestly. That is Christendom. We live in an absolutely pagan world. Now, everyone can't move to that, I understand. But you got to say, even, even Steubenville has a little flavor of it. I know it's Novus Ordo and it's a lot, you know, a lot of modernism <laughs> mixed in there. But there's a beautiful Catholic culture in Steubenville that when we visited, I, I got a little taste of. And it's like, it, it's pretty cool when you're surrounded by Catholics. Like, mm -hmm. there's just something really joyous about just being surrounded by Catholics all the time. And you go into the local bakery and there's a there's a, a an icon on the wall at the bakery. And it's like. You catch little glimpses of that in like very Italian neighborhoods in the Bronx, like uh, on Arthur Ave. Every store you go in, they'll have a little like a uh, uh, a little altar in in every bakery and every uh, you know every meat store, everything. So it's there's something really beautiful about when you have that cultural Catholicism in the air. It's, it really is like Christendom. It's nice. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, this this can segue perfectly into. Uh, the good bishop himself, because this bishop is trying to fight for elements of not just cultural, but doctrinal Christendom. So how do yeah. you guys want to crack open? Rob, you got the show? article? No. You... Oh, let me find it. Uh, well, it was a letter that he wrote to his, his pastoral letter, his pastoral letter. So, I mean, you could probably just pull it up, right? Yeah, I'll pull it up here. Yeah, While we do that, up. short Farrell paid a hundred dollars to listen to this. I don't know. I don't know why. I... Can't get it up your love, babe. <laughs> they paid a hundred dollars to hear that. Wow. Yeah, I hope it was worth it. <laughs> I have. I'm just gonna start texting them because, like, I'll, I'll put them up on YouTube or something because he sends me them all the time. Uh, Here we go. I got it. Man, you got it. Let's see. Here's the. So here's the thing. We're going to have to do a little coded language here um, Why? because he, he gets into some issues that I don't think uh, yeah. YouTube's going to like. Um, Dear sons and daughters in Christ, may the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you always. In this time of great turmoil in the church and in the world, I must speak to you from a father's heart in order to warn you of the evils that threaten us. See, this is the thing. Like the, the crisis in the church is a crisis of fatherhood. Like that is the crisis in the church. Like the, the 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 battle between marriage and the family comes down to a crisis of fatherhood, and mainly in the church that so many of the men that are priests have this deep father wound, and they don't know how to be fathers, and they think to be a good father is to just give your children whatever they want not what your children need. And there are so many real fathers that do that. And our priests are doing that right now. It's the whole point of the synod on synodality is a group of fathers who think it's best to just give the children whatever they want instead of giving the children what they need. Um, the evil... The evil and false message that has invaded the church, Christ's bride, is that Jesus is only one among many and that... It is not necessary for his message to be shared with all humanity. This idea must be shunned and refuted at every turn. We must share the joyful good news that Jesus is our only Lord and that he desires that all humanity for all time may embrace eternal life in him. <clears throat> he, he gets the toxicity of ecumenism. Mm -hmm. Ecumenism is just indifference. I mean, it's just... It's just indifference to every other faith out there. It's like, oh, let's just go and do whatever. And it doesn't matter what God you, and you know, all roads lead to God. And it is such a toxic thing. 
In St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, he writes, I'm amazed that you were so quickly forsaking the one who called you by the, by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, not that there is another, but there are some who disturbing you and wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, and now say, I, now I say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than that that you have received, let that one be anathema. Like you guys have to really understand that Paul wrote this not for the Christians of his time. It's for us. Like that is who he wrote this for. When he, when he talks in uh, Thessalonians, and he's saying, um, what does he say in Thessalonians? Uh, he talks about in Second Thessalonians two, second, that, that there will be like they're they're right. Men will the, doctrine the con- that will tickle their ears. Oh yeah, so that that's gonna be that's gonna be um, yeah, First Timothy. But yeah, oh, that's it's, First Timothy. It, but but Second Thessalonians, it talks about the great falling away, and it, yeah. it is about in a certain sense people heaping to themselves teachers who have itching ears. Um, but yeah, no, what I love about this line that this bishop has given Bishop Strickland is that you almost see where he's clearly seeing things in the sense of this is like what we're seeing right now with this synod and synodality. And again, like this crazy stuff that we're already experienced, we're not even in October yet. Like it's going to get really wild. And so that's why that everyone, you need to be absolutely praying, not just for the leaders, but also for find the gift of final perseverance because it's going to shake a lot of the faiths of the faithful. But this is something that's very true. What we're being told is that church doctrine can change and, or that it can be pastorally applied to where practically the doctrine changes, you know, okay. The doctrine stays the same, but pastorally it doesn't really matter. That is my friends, a doctrine of demons, 110%. Yeah, there's more than one way to teach. And this is what I said to Trent Horn. You can say something in the letter, uh, like, uh, okay, so the catechism didn't change. But when you do something in practice, that is teaching. So if the church oh, yeah. is, you know, that's a, that's a form of teaching. So don't say the church isn't teaching that same-sex unions can be blessed. Because just by them having the conversation, they've given the impression that it's possible. And that is teaching the world that the Catholic Church is about to change the teaching on human sexuality. So... Yeah. As your as your spiritual father, I feel it is important to reiterate the following basic truths that have always been understood by the church from the time immemorial and to emphasize that the church exists not to redefine matters of faith, but to safeguard the deposit of faith as it has been handed down from us to us from our Lord himself through the apostles and the saints and martyrs. Again, hearkening back to St. Paul's warning to the Galatians, any attempts to pervert the gospel message must be categorically rejected as injurious to the bride of Christ and her individual members. The other thing I'm seeing in this is Cardinal Burke just wrote that foreword, right? Mm -hmm. Cardinal Burke wrote that foreword. Vegano has been putting a lot of stuff out lately. Schneider Uh, has that new catechism. Schneider has a new catechism. Courage is also contagious, right? So like... Mm -hmm. Mimetic desire works both ways. It's not just that n- nobody wants to be the center of attention. They want to fit in with the crowd. It's also when somebody does something courageous and bold and speaks the truth, it inspires other men to do that too. And I think Strickland saw the Burke intro to that book. And I think that he really felt pressed on his heart from God to, it's time for me to speak up and say something. How could you not? I mean, that's one thing that I, I do not understand how you could not, because if you truly love our Lord Jesus Christ, how could you not? speak about the wickedness that's going on because i mean one thing you said anthony i fully agree with you were talking about like how your actions are a practical catechesis essentially right it's a practical instruction of what's going on from francis's mouth himself he says preach the gospel not with words but with your actions well the gospel he's preaching through his actions it's not it's and what's so scary about this is it's like you can you can again aquinas talks about this all the time when it comes to you know uh, internal versus external actions you can 100 and an external action is nothing more than just a, in a certain sense, a revelation or a clue of what's going on internally. We can't obviously judge a person's heart in the absolute objective sense unless they say something, right? So I cannot objectively say Joe Schmo from Idaho is in sin doing X by me just looking at him. But I can say, okay, if he's doing all of these things, which very much so give the appearance of adultery then maybe he needs to be called out, talked to, 
you know, maybe there needs to be some fraternal correction, that action of charity applied. When it comes to this stuff, though, I mean, we are 110 million light years away from Pius X's understanding of the Catholic faith. I brought this up the other, uh, the last night on uh, Return of the King. What do you guys think Pope Innocent III, the great medieval yeah. pope, would be doing right now if he like took a time machine, if you will? He would, he would lose Falling his mind. Crusade. Yeah, he'd launch a crusade. He'd absolutely yeah. launch a crusade. He would call all faithful Catholics, and you know what? Would he would be surprised? He'd be like, "Wow, there's so few." Like mm -hmm. a, a bunch, a bunch of dudes, <laughs> a bunch of trad dudes show up ready for the crusade, um, and and that's about it. I mean. It's so incredibly scary, but that's what's so interesting about the situation is that like it is lining up very much so with what scripture talks about of that holy remnant that will. All yeah, like I, I don't I think a lot of people going into this are especially the, the, the normie Catholics are like they're like, no, nah, you don't have to worry. God will protect his church from this. I don't think people understand it is going to get so bad that you will think all hope is lost. And at the final moment, God's glory will be shown. Like it yeah. is going to look like all hope is lost. It is not going to improve anytime soon. It is going to exceedingly get worse and worse to the point where you think the gates of hell have prevailed. And then at the final moment, God's glory will be shown in a way where you know without a doubt this is God. Yeah, fully agree. I like uh, Joseph's comment here. I would just add, you'll probably see like a couple uh, carts of, uh, you know, bourbon, whiskey, and like, you know. And then tobacco. me and Rob showing up in Crocs and shorts. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> one day I'll have to give you guys, to not derail it, but one day I'll have to give you guys my spicy opinion on Crocs. So. Oh, we'll, we'll do that for locals. But Yeah, we'll go. So listen, we're going to. I think we go. should derail for just one minute because something just dropped that we all need to see. Ah, nice. the mug shot. The Trump mug mug shot. shot. Look at that face. All right, you know what? We're going to do three more minutes on here, and we are going to finish this on Locals. So everybody, look, it's going to be for free to anybody on Locals. But if you come over to Locals, um, if you're not a paid member, you can't comment. You can't, you know, there's things. You, there are restrictions, right. but you can watch the rest you, of the stream we'll, on Locals. We'll let you watch it. You won't have to pay to watch it. Just come over to Locals. Yeah, we um, want to get as many people onto the locals platform as because we're going to get suspended here one day. We're going to lose our platform, and we want to have as many people on our locals platform as mm -hmm. possible so that we're not just speaking into the void afterward, you know? So, should we do some of the questions people had for Nick here? And yeah, Nick let's do that. Let's go. do let's do Nick's questions, and then so we got about three minutes, and then we're going to do forty five minutes over on locals. Maybe uh, Nick can play uh, Richmond North of Richmond for us on the banjo and no, locals. No, I, I can't do that. That's it was good though. I did listen to it. Uh, I think like two or three days after we got back, because everyone was just like, "Listen to this thing." And aside from the foul music, which I or the foul uh, language that I can never necessarily endorse, uh, the message one hundred ten percent agree with. Yeah, Phenomenal. I'm just not a fan of that style of music. So, uh, does Nick have any reading recommendations for mental prayer? I'd say so. I guess it depends if one you're wanting to understand mental prayer more, or if you're wanting to use a book for mental prayer. If you're wanting to use a book for mental prayer, I would recommend the Meditations of Saint Alphonsus Liguori. So pretty much all of his works, I would say like, you know, ninety plus percent of his works are going to be meditation works. So a good work to start off with would be, um, I think it's called the Steps of Salvation and Perfection, or it's on on the Cause of Salvation and Perfection by Saint Alphonsus Liguori. His Phenomenal meditations work. on the stations are the best. Yeah. Exactly. That'd be another great one. Yeah. Start with something like that. I would say uh, that would be a good place to start. If you're wanting to not understand more about what mental prayer is, um, a good work that I would say that expounds upon it more, but it's somewhat repetitive would be the work um, Soul of the Apostolate. I'm forgetting the name of it. Written, I think, maybe by a Benedictine monk. I could be wrong on that, but it, I know it is one of the personal favorites of Pope St. Pius X. But yeah, just look up The Soul of the Apostle. It's a great, it's a phenomenal book written by a French author. Uh, have you read any of the debates between uh, Garigou Lagrange and Francisco Marin Sola? I have not. I have, Well, at least on the subject of grace and predestination, I have not. I have not read any of these. Um, I do know a little bit, though, about some of the controversies that Garrett Grew fought against when it came to issues, when it came to the subject of predestination. So I've skimmed through his work on predestination, just his book, Predestination. I've never read the whole thing. So to be honest, I don't know, but it does sound very interesting. If, 
if you uh, are on Instagram and you have like a link to it, uh, please send it to me or something like that. That'd be actually really great. Or maybe just pin it in the comments or something. Put it in the comment section. I'd love to read it. So we know you're a uh, choleric melancholic. How about the Myers Brig? Myers Brig. Uh, I think I'm. Uh, I think it's an INTJ. Let me look up real quick. I think I'm I, pretty sure it's an INTJ. Let's see. I think see. I'm I'm INTJ as well, actually. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, INT uh, the architect, I believe it is. Uh, yeah, I am yeah. INTJ the architect. I don't know any of those. Well, now you know too, apparently. So yeah, you, yours is DAGO. Dago, is that a joke? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yours is WAP, Anthony. <laughs> uh, you got any more questions? All right. I'd like yeah, to hear Nick's, more. I like to hear Nick's thoughts on different forms of monasticism and mysticism. Yeah. So, uh, I guess just kind of interpreting how I do. So, monasticism wise, I do think that the best form of monasticism that you can find. Um, is going to actually be the traditional Dominican life. I'm not just saying that because I am a Dominican, a third order Dominican, but because I do believe that it is in a certain sense, the um, very direct practicing of the life of Christ through both prayer, study, contemplation. So you see, it's like you saw this in the the gospel, was it today's gospel? In the traditional mass for St. Bartholomew, but our Lord, yeah, going off, praying all night. But then when it comes to myst, and so you see that when it comes to mysticism, monasticism, but then he also goes out to preach. And so when it comes to mysticism, definitely the works that you see, um, I would say Father Garagru in his Three Ages of the Interior Life perfectly nails down both Aquinas and harmonizes that with St. John of the Cross. So if you're wanting to see like a good Thomistic understanding of my mysticism and then elements of practicing that, check out Three Ages of the Interior Life if you have time. It's quite a long work. Yeah, Aurora, Rob just put the link into, into the comments. So you could just click that link and that will bring you right to the locals page. So all you have to do is just you might have to register for a locals account, but yeah, but it doesn't cost anything. You could just want and you'll you just they probably just want your email and stuff. So yeah. mm -hmm. the question so, is, is this is this show really worth the time that it takes to sign up for locals? I don't know. <laughs> I <laughs> hope so. <laughs> uh you got a date for the documentary, Nick? So yeah, um, Margo, I think it's going to be somewhere, not an exact date, but I'm thinking somewhere late September, early October. The only reason I don't have an exact date is just because I have about 200 hours of audio alone that I have to sift through. And the, the, the documentary, I'm, I'm wanting to be no more than an hour and a half probably. Um, but yeah, so finding like what works good, editing all of that. Um, the clips are great. The clips are phenomenal. It's just a lot of the audio that's going to be kind of like, you know, has to be done. I also have a little bit of filming left to do uh, some stuff around here, some kind of biographical work, but also just trying to expound upon different sections of the Summa, link it with some good chant in the background of stuff that I've actually filmed, you know, making that presentable to the audience, I think is going to be uh, something that's going to be a bit of a challenge because I mean, I mean, I don't know how many, how many people are really interested in the insolvent controversy or something. So like this that. is Devin, right? This is Devin. Yeah. All right, Devin, you got to come with Nick to pa i want nick to bring his recording stuff like your, your cameras and stuff and i want to film our You're being used in other words yeah for sure you can you can, <laughs> like you, can be the, you can be the filmer you can you can hang out yeah, i don't care i just want i just want to get he, video of what it's like when 12 14 guys get together hang out sit around a fire the conversations we're gonna have like i, I think that people would really enjoy seeing I think we're going to have some phenomenal conversations around the fire at night. It, like those Father Nix will be there to give us, you know, daily mass. We're going to have daily mass with Father Nix. It's going, to, it's going to be pretty awesome. And I want people to experience what some of those conversations are going to be. You know how I know Joe Diodati's uh, jealous? That's <laughs> gay. <laughs> he would be here in a second. He would. If he could. <laughs> if he okay, wasn't having a baby... He's having a baby. That's the only reason he's not coming. He would be flying to New York or, and and meeting us. Yeah. One last one last question, actually, from Joe. One of Joe's questions. Do they? Uh, yeah. I, my lights are not great. <laughs> yeah, I believe. Hmm. I'm not entirely sure. Familiar what prayer this is? To be completely 110 percent honest, um, just showing off that he knows a Latin prayer. Yeah, I was like, I I'm not. not sure but i would say it, it's the it's the saint benedict 
Now oh, Draco that... said to me he ducks. Right? Oh, okay. That yeah, I so I'd never seen them do it, but it wouldn't surprise me because there's a lot of their prayers that they do say in the chapter room together themselves, and it's not in the public. So there's certain devotions and things like that. It would not surprise me at all being a traditional Benedictine monastery, them saying it, but it's probably gonna be private, them together. Joe, you're saying you don't tell people we're pregnant? Is that what you're saying? Like when you and your wife, you don't you don't tell people no, we're pregnant. We're expecting we're she's expecting. pregnant. <laughs> we're pregnant. Great, great uh, distinctions. All right, come on, let's wrap this up. We're going over to locals, guys. We're gonna wrap up the if anybody's catching this on a rerun, uh, you know, a stream later on, go sign up for our locals, check it out. And the the full video will will be on locals at least for some period. I I don't know how long. Yeah, and we're going to get into some spicier things than the Strickland letter. We got, I mean, I have a couple of funny videos that I want to play over we'll, there too. We'll so. only have uh, about thirty-five minutes. When thirty-five it's all minutes. Done. So let's 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 get going, everybody. All right, guys, we will see you uh, Tuesday for trivia. Tuesday oh. for trivia. And then Tuesday Thursday. for trivia. That's what we're going to see. And then and Thursday, Saturday, 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 we're recording an interview with Bishop Schneider that will be released at the end of October in conjunction with his new catechism. Oh, yeah. great. Sounds or awesome. Or the interview is going to be so good that he's going to let us release it right away and he'll come back for another interview at the end yeah. of October. And she, They made me confirm this morning that we will wait to release it. I will. You're going to see. I'm going to have such a good conversation with him. I'm going to say, come <laughs> on, Bishop Schneider, let us release okay. this and then come back on he, in October. He's not an Italian. He's an old German dude. It's not going to go over well. You're then. probably right. <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> and, he's <a> <laughs> and he's yeah, a saint. And he's a saint. Yeah, I he agree. is. He's amazing. So, all right. We will see you guys on Tuesday. For anybody not going to locals, everybody else will see you on locals. Hello darkness, my old friend, I've come to talk with you again.